Welcome to Caucus Connections, a podcast with the Kentucky House Majority Caucus. Welcome to the interim edition of Caucus Connections. I'm your host, John Alexander. This week we'll be talking to Representative Jerry T. Miller of the 36th District about testimony heard in the July Interim Joint Committee meetings on local and state government. Then we'll be hearing from Representative Randy Bridges of the 3rd District about his work as co-chair of the PVA Office Task Force. First up, Representative Jerry T. Miller. And we are here with Caucus Connections. I'm John Alexander here with Representative Jerry T. Miller of the 36th District, which is uh, part of Jefferson County and part of Oldham County. How, how are you today, sir? Doing great. Doing great. It's uh, uh, good to be in Frankfurt. I don't get up here that much anymore. We want to, we're going to talk about a couple of the committees you serve on, um, local and state government. But first, kind of want to get some background on you. Talk to me a little bit about your background. But before you became a legislator, talk to me kind of about your life before you got sure. here to Frankfurt. Educated in Shelby County Public Schools, uh, went to the University of Kentucky and graduated. Met my wife uh, in a math class and uh, married. We've been married uh, oh, about 47 years. After UK, I was uh, took the CPA exam, passed the exam, worked in a CPA firm environment for four years. Uh, then was uh, recruited by Humana, this is when Humana was uh, really in a growing phase back in the 70s. Off and on stayed there and or successor companies for about uh, 25 years and then got an interest in, in public service. Worked in the Fletcher administration for four years and including some time as uh, Commissioner of Kentucky State Parks. Then uh, after uh, Governor Fletcher lost that election, then dabbled in local politics, uh, ran for Louisville Metro Council, was in that for four years, which is one term, and then redistrict occurred in, uh, I think, 2012. Actually, by the time it was actually done, it was probably 2013, and they had created a new district because in my old Metro Council district, we had, it had grown from 2000 to 2010 about 40%. So with all that growth, we've, of course, deserved uh, a new house district. So uh, I was uh, right in the heart of it, and about 60% of my council district fell in that district. So it was a a logical step, and and my interests, because of my financial background, dealt with pensions. I'd really grown in as a metro councilman. Uh, to have a, a huge interest in that because of the double-digit growth in in the retirement cost was gobbling up our budget. And that's been one of your m- main focuses as a legislator, too, it, hasn't it? It's so many, it, like a lot of us in Frankfurt, uh, we all have something that pushes us over the edge to right. actually want to run for office. And and the the pensions and the retirement system mess is was really mine. It's, that's what made me want to do this. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit, too, about kind of what we're going through right now uh, with, with, with COVID-19, with our, our current uh, you know, state of emergency that we're going through. You're, you're a numbers guy, but you're also a student of history, aren't you? I love history. Uh, exactly. Right? And, and, I, and I know that, know that about you, and, and you're one of the people I wanted to ask this specific question to. I'm not asked this of anybody yet. Is this the worst we've ever been through? Is this when, when you when you when when you when you look back on say I don't want to say the entire the entirety of America itself, but really look back over the past hundred years. Have have, have we ever been at this point where we've been this divided? Uh, it, whether you talk politically or socially or, or what have you, has America been at this? juncture before. Politics have been nasty for a long, long time. Right, I, I, right. You know, Jefferson and Adams back 230, 40 years ago, if it's the same way. I, I don't know that it's, it seems that way. I will acknowledge it seems that way. But I was reading, I get a publication and I was reading it this week and it said there was an inscription on a Chaldean, this is like uh, Iraq, uh, Chaldean, uh, tablet wailing about how corrupt politicians were and society is at its lowest point ever. And that's 3,600 years ago. You know, I think everybody thinks that their time is probably worse. Frankly, my parents 
would have gone through the Depression and World War II. My grandfather sur actually survived the Spanish flu. He caught the Spanish flu and fortunately for me survived. So it's, it's every, every generation has its challenges. One of the committees you serve on is local government. And really the topic of the entire uh, committee seemed to be police reform, uh, justice reform, things along those lines. One of the questions you had that I found interesting that you asked, you, you talked about center mass, where part of the training is that officers shoot center, center they fire, they're, they're trained to shoot right, and they're, fire they're center, trained, center mass. Right, to shoot center mass of whatever is visible. Right, and I think part of uh, where people go askew with the conversation is that you know, maybe they've watched too many movies, they think the, that a police officer can shoot the, shoot the gun out of somebody's hand or shoot someone in the leg and uh, uh, impair them at that point. But really, explain to me and what they explained center mass was. It's not even necessarily shooting center mass of the entire person, but it's, it's what they can see, correct? Right, of, of what's available to them. Because my wife and I have discussed this over the years, and neither of us have ever been in law enforcement. Right. I want to emphasize yes. that. And sometimes it's, well, the guy had a knife. Why did you have to shoot him center mass uh, to take him down? And the, uh, the head, and I believe this was uh, asked the head of the Sheriff's Association, uh, uh, Sheriff from uh, Davies County, and he just said that if you are called to, on, to use deadly force, that's what that means. That's deadly force that you feel threatened. So if you feel so threatened by that person that you need to take him down, that's that's what they're trying to do. Right. Send him as. Um, talk to him, and we'll go from from local government really to, to state government. Uh, and uh, the Secretary of State Michael Adams talked about the 2020 primary election. Uh, how important do you think it was that the entire process was was a bipartisan process? It it certainly was good going into the primary election because we. Had, there was no pl no time to plan. Uh, it was more reactive on the and the county clerks and the secretary of state and the governor did. You know they had to come together with a plan and it was by no means perfect, but it got us through that primary election. And Secretary of State Adams has received glowing reports uh, nationwide about how did he do it, how did Kentucky do it. Part of it was the the bipartisan nature from the secretary of state and the governor. Uh, a lot of the credit goes to the to the county clerks. Doesn't mean it was perfect by any means. For Jefferson County, we had one location to vote early, and then on election day, we had one location, and that was that was really a hardship on a lot of people. But it's driven by our poll workers are by and large elderly. Right. Well, they're when I say elderly, they're they're 60s, 70s uh, age group, and they're not interested in volunteering if they're going to be exposed to that. So it's going to be a challenge, uh, and, and Secretary of State Adams talked about the challenges is, he said, early voting seemed to work, but two weeks is probably too long. I suggested maybe three days, Friday, Saturday, Monday. He said that's probably too short. We do need to allow for that uh, on, a, on an expanded basis, but we also need to make sure that there are more locations. Uh, my colleague, Jason Nemus, and I both believe that we probably should have had 18 or 20 in Jefferson County. It's a population of 750,000 people, right. so we really needed more than one. And I think we can get enough people to volunteer, or it's effectively volunteering, although they get a right. small payment, to work the polls to at least have, hopefully, 20 in Jefferson County. But Secretary State Adams made a point. It's too, he's not ready to roll this out yet. He's still evaluating what worked, what didn't work. What, one of the things that did work was no excuse absentee balloting. And I want to make the point in which he, uh, I think he tried to make as well, which is absentee balloting and no excuse absentee balloting is different from mail-in voting. Mail-in voting, which there are some advocates around the country that say that's the thing we ought to do, is just mail out a ballot to every registered voter. But we all know that fraud exists I know from knocking doors, and I knocked on 7,000 doors last uh, election cycle, I know the election, the, the rolls are just sadly out of date. So I would go to a house and sometimes there would be three families listed 
in that one residence. And it was like the last person that uh, was there and, and the person before them. So we know that and, and mail-in I, voting, if you mail a ballot to every registered voter, it's it's just fraught with, with peril in terms of, of fraud. And, and that's another thing he's trying to clean up too, isn't it? The voter rolls. He's, he's doing a very good job of that, he's, isn't he? Right. He is having to clean up the, the, uh, the previous Secretary of State, who was the first one not to try to clean up voter rolls uh, out of her predecessors, and that's a couple of Republicans and a couple of Democrats. So she left us in a bad state in terms of right. voter rolls. So he's he's got to work on that right in the middle of the COVID pandemic. The uh, one other point I, he made, and I think it's good to make about no excuse absentee balloting. It's certainly going to be a part of the general election. However, there are too many. There were too many absentee ballots to count in two or three days well, because Matt, it was a week long before we ever got results. So he exactly. said, we're going to have to restrict that a little bit so that if you're, uh, and these are my words, not his, if you're in, in the vulnerable group, you get a no excuses ballot. But maybe if you're 30 and in perfect health, you don't get a no excuses ballot. And we will expect you to vote in person either early or at, on the day of the election. And will it help too, and I think we might have mentioned that, you might have mentioned this in the meeting as well, is is to move that process up a little bit to where, you know, with, with the general election, we need those results that day, right. especially for something as important as what we're what we're dealing with in November. I mean, all, all elections are important, yeah. I believe, but it, this one, this is a doozy. It you is, know? it is. And, and we talked about, uh, about starting the vote count of absentee ballots earlier, and now they have time to plan that out to make sure it's a supervised process. But sure, yeah, I mean, if, if people are mailing in ballots for three or four weeks before the election day, quote unquote, then they need to start counting ballots sooner than the than that night. How do you, how do you feel about and and this was one thing that uh, uh, Secretary of State brought up was Kentucky knows best how to run its elections. Now there were a lot of outside forces, there were a lot of uh, outside voices that were trying to influence. What, what both Governor Bashir and um, Secretary of State Adams were, were trying to do. I know almost all legislators right now are getting calls from out of the state for, for, for different, top, different topics. How does that make you feel that people from outside of the state are, are not only trying to influence, that, influence our, our elections as far as saying we should have done this or we should have done that, uh, and, then, and then also trying to in, influence policy and different things that, that you people that don't even know really right. what, what what is going I, on. I, I think we know our history. We know the problems that Kentucky's had in the past. Uh, we've had had some very bad election fraud and people have wound up in jail over it. So the work that Secretary Adams, who I think is probably the most qualified in terms of his background, the most qualified Secretary of State we've had in my memory, uh, and, and he's developing a plan. He'll put out that plan. Uh, I think he'll get buy-in from the governor because the, he and the governor seem to have a decent, relation, good relationship. So hopefully that and then bringing in the uh, county clerks will give us a, a good result tailored to Kentucky uh, because we want people to vote. That's, that's why we're here. We want to understand the will of the people. And a safe election, uh, and I'll, I'll Borrowing his phrase, safe to vote or easy to vote, hard to cheat. That's that's what we want in an election. That's what I hope everybody wants. Um, one thing, too, is, we, and when we, and we'll go back to local government a little bit, but not much, but, uh, and it, it actually works out with, with, with state government as well, is when you've got, when you're talking about police reform or whatever subject you might talk about, uh, and then also, um, Voting in, in Kentucky as well. Are the solutions that work in Louisville and Lexington the same solutions that would work for Pulaski County or Eastern Kentucky? Are, is, is there a blanket answer for any of these things, or, 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 or do, does it need to be more specific for uh, individual areas like that, the urban areas versus rural areas? Or, or, give, give me give me your take on that. I, I think we we at the state level need to set up out certain guidelines and rules. And I, I applaud President Stivers for taking the lead in saying, 
uh, no knock warrants. We this should be hard to do. We Across should not do that, and everybody needs to abide by that law. But having grown up in Shelby County and representing a rural area of, of Oldham County, I can tell you it's uh, Louisville Metro Police. That's a different organization than the Shelby County Sheriffs, and they're all good people, but their the challenges are just different. And so allowing some home rule control over those local laws, I think, is, is a good thing. Uh, thank you so much, again, Representative Jerry T. Miller of the 36th District talking with us here on Caucus Connections. Now we'll hear from Representative Randy Bridges about the PVA Office Task Force and the effect COVID-19 is having on real estate across the Commonwealth. And I'm here talking with Representative Randy Bridges of the 3rd District, which is part of McCracken County. Uh, here talking about the, the PVA Office Task Force. How are you today, sir? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I am all right. Tell me, tell me a little bit about the, the meeting this week and, and, and talk about just generally what the PVA Office Task Force does. We, uh, we had our first meeting this past week, and uh, the uh, duties we've been assigned with are to, are to study the operations of the PVA administrators offices and uh, do you know try to identify the best practices to reduce things like redundancy increase you know ways to increase efficiency improve their processes uh, look for cost saving measures uh, and and another thing is create uniformity among the offices located within the commonwealth you know we we want to uh, also you know, study the funding of the PVA's offices, uh, uh, identify if other funding methods or an increase in the current level is, is needed, and also to study each PVA administrator's job, their requirements, their uh, property valuation methods, you know, the time frame uh, established in relation to the ad valerium, you know, taxation process. Right. Uh, it's, an, it's an overall review of the property valuation administrator's offices and uh, see where we can uh, see what we can do as a state to better help them because that that is uh, it is so important especially at a local government level because property taxes fund schools fire departments libraries you know several different areas it and, and that's what a lot of our local uh, city and counties depend upon for their revenue tell me where where does that funding come from for the most part uh, most of it comes from uh, tax property taxes, but there are uh, tangible taxes, uh, things of that nature, you know, business equipment, inventory, things of that nature, too. But the majority of it comes from uh, uh, directly from property taxes. And, and talk to me a little bit about the job duties of a, of a PVA. If you're a PVA, what, what is your main what is your main purpose? Just take it from a take it from a layman's uh, perspective. What, what, what do they do? Well, they're responsible for assessing all real and tangible property tax, uh, you know, property at 100% of its fair cash value as of January 1st of each year. You know, real property is residential, farm, commercial, and then tangibles, cars, boats, airplanes, trailers, business inventory, fixtures, uh, furniture, you know, it, it's... Uh, you know that that and, and it's it's pretty extensive. I don't think people realize the uh, the effect that has on our state as a whole. During this time of COVID, talk to me about real estate. Has it had an an, an obvious effect on real estate, or is this something we'll see later down the road? Yes, or both. <laughs> but both. It, it, it it does. It is having a direct effect on real estate right now. Our market. We are. Uh, I met yesterday to review where we are through from January to uh, present time through the end of June this year. And to give you an instance, our our volume is actually up. Uh, in in our that would be the uh, Paducah Board of Realtors, which encompasses Paducah, McCracken County, and 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 it goes out into other surrounding counties and everything. Um, in, in 2019, we had a little over, right at $65 million in sales. This year, we're, we're at 70 million, so it's up $5 million. And, and that's surprising to me. I, I figured it'd actually be down. But the uh, biggest thing we're facing is an inventory shortage right now. We uh, active listings, and we're, we're down about 150 listings. And of our current active listings, there's about 110 or so of those that are pending that have contracts on them. So that even puts us down lower compared to last year. We probably had 75 impending or so, 75 to 80. So our, our inventory's down, and I, I, 
I feel like COVID has affected it. You know, I mean, uh, it's it's people that do they want to risk a stranger coming into their house and, you know, that may be infected and put their family at jeopardy and, and vice versa. If they were, you know, going out buying a house, do they want to be out in the public at that? you know, with that risk in mind. So, well, and, and you, and you say too, even a stranger coming into your house, looking at the house at this point, you know, even people we know, if we don't know where they've been, uh, you know, exactly. it's, that, that could, that could be a problem too. Oh, absolutely. Right now our active listings are down about 15%, you know, from last year. So, you know, that goes back to supply and demand and what that has done. It, it's, it's pushed the, the prices up in our area. To, to give you an instance, uh, the average price is up, uh, it's about 6%, about a little over $10,000. The medium price of the listings out there are up $14,000. That's that's 10%. You know, we yeah. we went from a medium price house of 135 thousand to 150,000, you know, or 136. So, you know, and then our, our, our average straight across the board, it, it's up about $10,000. So, you know, that goes back to just, just general basic business, you know, supply and demand. Right. The, 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 the inventory may be a little bit lower, but the, but because of that, the prices are a bit higher, correct? Yes, sir. In, in these interim episodes of, of Caucus Connections that we've been doing, we, we've covered a lot of the state, but we haven't spent too much time in, in western Kentucky. What are some of your constituents telling you just about different things, whether it be the, uh, the, the, the governor's uh, emergency uh, declarations and things along that nature, or, or just on a, on a daily basis? What sort of calls are you getting? Well, they, you know, I guess the biggest call people call me and said, I need you to talk to the governor. And at this point, our efforts to reach out to the governor have been muted. You know, that, that's probably my, my personally, that's, that's my, right. you know, I, I ran for office. I want to be a public servant and I want to be a part of that process. And uh, I, I've talked to our house leadership and uh, there has been very little, if any, correspondence between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And, and, and I really don't understand it. You know, we, we've got uh, 139 people in Frankfurt. We've got 100 representatives. 38 senators and one governor and so far to this day pretty much the one governor has made all the decisions and uh, i mean there's 138 men and women peppered throughout the state it's very diverse group it's you know and who else knows their districts and the needs and I, i i would say that the biggest complaint i get from constituents is why are we having to do certain things when we're not affected by it? I, I spent a couple of hours yesterday talking uh, with some of our local health officials. Well, and that, and, and that uh, may be that may be something else too that that we need to bring up is, uh, and I think you and I talked about this the other day. Uh, you know, in the past few meetings that the the gov- uh, his his media briefings at at four o'clock every day, the, some some of the ones here recently. He said how much of a hotbed um, Western Kentucky is for a lot of these, a lot of these cases that are now uh, popping up. Is that what you're seeing over there? Are you actually seeing a lot of those cases? I, 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 I have to object to that. I mean, I, I've talked to uh, you know McCracken County in Western Kentucky, and and let me say West Kentucky. Uh, there is a part of the state past Owensboro and Bowling Green. Right. That people don't realize it goes all the way down to Fulton, Hickman, Carlisle counties, and uh, uh, McCracken is probably the biggest area in that part of the state, west of Owensboro and Bowling Green. There's a slight uptick, but there's not a huge spike at all. And I mean, I, I've talked to our uh, major health care providers, and uh, to give you just uh, a, a little bit of what we talked about, symptomatic test. Uh, one healthcare provider said they've they've performed a little over six thousand tests. In that, there's uh, nineteen positives. That's a 03 percent positive rate. They they also went back and they use a, a ten day history in, in the past ten days in uh, just symptomatic tests. People come in and say I, I may have COVID. I, I'm worried about this. They get tested. 
you know, because they feel like they may have symptoms. Of course, right. it could be allergy. It could be a common cold. It could be a number of different things, but they are parallel with symptoms of, of COVID. And in the past 10 days, they've had three tested positive. So that's so, just, you know, that's, that's so, a very low rate. So you know? really, in, in your part of the state, what you're telling me is that as far as where you are, the the hospitals the the medical providers they haven't been they haven't been overwhelmed at all have they no no and, and i asked them i said where are you at as far as preparedness and they said we are prepared to handle you know the uptick and it, it's not a problem the the problem is when i talk to other physicians at these facilities they say it's killing our our, our business because I, I talked to uh, one gentleman he's a neurologist he said i've got people with problems that need to be in the hospital it's uh you know no it's not life and death but you know if they suffer from these symptoms very long they will be irreversible and there'll be irreversible damage but yet we have to we are forced to hold so many beds open, you know, in case of an uptick in, you know, for this. And uh, we got to be careful that the, the cure is not worse than the than the problem. Right, you know, than uh, the disease and, itself. And, well, I, I want to be clear about some of the numbers I use here. You know, there's three areas our, our local health officials are looking at, you know, our health providers. One is the symptomatic test. The other is the emergency room. You know, people come in the emergency room, regardless of what they're there for, you know, they had to be tested. And uh, what's that rate? Their, their rate, it, that, that is higher. That's about 5.4%. They've had five in the last 10 days that come in on that. And then you look at urgent care, and in their last 10 days, they've had 10 positive in the last 10 days. So, you know, yes, that is a little bit of an uptick, but it is not a huge spike to warrant possibly some of the uh, extreme conditions we're facing, some of the shutdowns. I, I, I was in a Cracker Barrel. Me and my wife just said, you know, it, we've had enough. We're going out to eat. So I went to Cracker Barrel. Go in on a Wednesday evening, and it, it's barren in there. And I, I'm talking to a young waitress, and she said, I'm just so glad to see you. And, I mean, it was like a ghost town. And Cracker yeah. Barrel in our town, they're usually sitting out front waiting and everything. I said, what's going on? I said, you've still got a 25%. She said, we're not even reaching that because people are – or uh, some are afraid to get out and others are assuming well if it's down to 25 percent there's no way we're ever going to get in there now and uh, she said we got five waitresses and we're, we're stumbling over ourselves and uh, you know and she said i don't, I don't know how i'm going to make it to feed my family and, and, and i admire this young lady because she could be on unemployment and, and and making more money and i asked her i said why why you did she said i believe she said i take pride in my work and she said i don't want to hand out she said i, I want to earn my keep and i mean i just i just about fell over to be honest with you i, I told her i said you are impressive and you 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 are my hero and we need to do that because uh, there's there's no saying there's more than one way to skin a cat i i believe there could be some changes in the way we're going to skin this cat and i believe the legislative branch uh could be a great asset and the the commonwealth is being hurt because of it well, i'll just be what, honest with you one what, what size does not fit all right what do you think about too and 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 this this may be what you're talking about as well we've got uh, you know, originally we did this to be able to flatten the curve, to be able to make it for two to three weeks, so that the so that the the healthcare providers would not be overwhelmed. We did that. We got to where, like you like you were talking about with the medical professionals you talked to, is that uh, that are in your area, is that you know they had that time to, pre- to prepare and they are prepared now. Do you feel like that what we're doing now and some of these extra steps that are being taken to 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 deal with an uptick that may or may not be there? Do you feel like that's that's starting to really get into overreach territory? Yes, but I want to pre-qualify that. I, I, I give our governor benefit of doubt that he's doing what he thinks is best, but he's one single person, and yes, he's got his experts that surround him, but each one of the legislators, the senators, and the representatives out in these districts, I mean, I've got physicians with years of experience that I'm talking to, and I feel like they know what's best in our area and what's going to, what 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 takes this. So, you know, do... Uh, We'll go back to your question, you know, do do I think these are starting to get extremes? In a lot of places, they are. And what I don't understand is if there's a hot spot, say it's Jefferson County, then why don't we direct that attention to Jefferson County? And I don't mean to be picking on the people of Jefferson County. I think they need to be protected, and we need to go to additional measures. But if it's not in another county, then why do those 
people in that county have to be restricted and everything because this is not just this is so much more and, and when we look at someone's health i understand these are lives at stake and we have to protect those lives but you know what about those that are being refused service because we've got a hospital down here that uh, possibly is, is occupancy you know their bed rate is 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 down drastically just in case we have an uptick well if we get an uptick that's significant enough, then we can stop bringing in new patients for elective surgeries or, or preventive measures or uh, symptoms of what they're su- suffering. We can say, no, nope, you got canceled because we got an uptick. But until then, why can't those people, I mean, you take someone with a heart condition and uh, you know as well as I do, the you know, if someone feels like they're having a heart, I mean, you got literally minutes before permanent damage can be done irreversible damage right and there's other things that these cardiologists tell us that you know if we could get this person in here and address some of these symptoms we could prevent that from happening and they're not allowed to so you know there it it, it yes it is uh, extreme in some cases and uh, and there again i, I want to give the uh, executive branch, you know, uh, I, I have no intentions of throwing them under the bus or anything, but I, I think they've allowed to put themselves in that position when they will not listen to our leadership that has reached out and offered any help they could get, and a deaf ear has been turned to them. So it, to, to it you, does concern to, me. To you, you this, this to you should be more of a surgical approach, shouldn't it? As far uh, as the hot spots go, yes, I think the hot spots should be looked at independently and maybe a radius around those and say what is happening, what's causing it, and see what we can do to prevent that. Because there's a long distance between Paducah and Pikeville, and there's uh, even with the PVAs we're working on, there's a great variance in what goes on in each one of our 120 counties. So, and I, I will go back. I think that it has been a disservice to the citizens of the Commonwealth of Kentucky not to allow their elected officials in their areas to have a say in what's, what's taking place. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Representative Randy Bridges of the 3rd District, uh, talking to us today on Caucus Connections. When, when, when am I, when am I going to see you back up here in Frankfurt again? Uh, probably about a week and a half or so. I believe we've got another PBA meeting on the 18th, and I've got some other uh, uh, interim joint committee meetings to attend also. So uh, I appreciate what you're doing, and uh, I tell you, I appreciate our, our, our caucus and our leadership uh, in, in what they're they're doing for us and their efforts to try to get us involved in this crisis because uh, uh, I'll say it again, I, I I think two heads are better than one, and I think 139 uh, uh, people putting input into this problem would would uh, greatly help the 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 not just the physical well well being as far as the health of the of Kentucky, but also the physical, you know, and that's the financial burden that uh, we're going to be facing in the next few years due to this crisis. You've been listening to Caucus Connections. Tune in next week for another episode from the House Majority Caucus.